Well, I don't know how many of you will ever have the experience of following uh, Sean Adams and Michael Beirut on stage, but all I can say is, and now for something completely different. Um, <laughs> please bear with me here. So I want to talk to you today about what we think or how we think. So expectations, beliefs, and assumptions like these have been a part of our modern worldview since the scientific revolution of the 17th century. I'm going to argue that we've been thinking this way for a very long time, and that these assumptions and beliefs and expectations completely direct how and what we think, and therefore how and what we design. Danella Meadows, uh, a very famous systems theorist, argued that our individual and collective mindsets or worldviews are the single most powerful leverage point for change. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to look at the anatomy and dynamics of worldview and propose that it's possible through intention to actually shift our individual wor worldviews as the basis for positive change and a more responsible way of designing. So a worldview is the shared idea in the minds of society, those great big unstated assumptions. And they're unstated because it's unnecessary to state them. Everybody already knows what they are. They constitute that society's paradigm or deepest set of beliefs about who they are and how the world works. The problem is, that a lot of these unchallenged, unnoticed beliefs and assumptions are often connected to all manner of what we would call wicked problems. Things like terrorism, pollution, overconsumption, and of course the global economic crisis, to name just a few. So if Einstein was correct when he maintained that problems cannot be solved from within the same mindset that created them, this would suggest that a fundamental shift in the way we think and therefore the way we design is in order. But first, what is a worldview and what the heck does it have to do with design? So a worldview is keyword, subjective, slice of reality that we construct individually and collectively across time and culture. It's an interpretive understanding of the world that is based upon our own experience. It is always a work in progress. We read the world, and at the same time, we read into the world in a process of perception and interpretation that usually reinforces our deepest held sets of beliefs and expectations. In other words, we see exactly what we expect to see. So worldviews are descriptive in that they tell us what is, but they're normative in that they tell us what ought to be. So in that way, they're very interesting. They're both a sketch of and blueprint for reality. But here's the rub. Worldviews are full of prejudice, incoherence, contradiction, and ironically, certainty. Because we believe that we see what is instead of understanding that we see a little slice of reality from a particular point of view. In other words, we don't see what we don't see. Legend has it that the native Patagonians were unable to see Magellan's ship anchored off the shore because their worldview did not encompass the concept of transatlantic travel. So in other words, they could not perceive what they could not conceive. 
This is a really important concept, I think, given where we need to go in the 21st century. They could not perceive what they could not conceive. <clears throat> so worldviews always influence how and what we design. Designed artifacts are the embodiment, in a way, of worldview. And what and how we design changes along with what we believe. So in the present, we're often oblivious to changes in our beliefs and assumptions because they go largely unchallenged. Gee, mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboro. But viewed in hindsight, the mindset of a particular era can seem prejudiced, illogical, or even downright crazy. You've come a long way, baby. Even within the space of a single lifetime, attitudes about smoking have made a 180 degree shift and are reflected in the communication design associated with them. Yet we rarely ask, what will people 100 years from now make of our current attitude and worldview? So my point is, maybe we should be asking, what will people 100 years from now make of our current worldview and attitudes. So worldviews usually change slowly, but under the right condition, an individual's mindset can change suddenly via an epiphany. Now, an epiphany is an archetype that runs deep in our culture. <clears throat> we want to believe that epiphanies are possible. And the archetype is, of course, Scrooge, who spent a very long, torturous night with three very difficult spirits, and he woke up in the morning transformed. But we so deeply believe in that, it plays every Christmas, doesn't it? We watch that every Christmas, along with It's a Wonderful Life, which again is predicated upon the idea that people can have epiphanies. Now, in the real world, one of the most, I suppose, well-known epiphanies in business and design is that of Ray Anderson, the CEO of Interface Carpet, who and I believe 1994 was handed these two books. He read these books, and they utterly changed him. He said, I was running a company that was plundering the earth, and I thought, damn, someday people like me are going to be put in jail. That was the moment of his epiphany. So the epiphany on the part of this one man changed a multi-billion dollar corporation and is precipitating change within that entire industry and is influencing business at large. The change of business strategy, design, manufacture, all followed a change in mindset. Government didn't mandate it. Business didn't ask for it. His worldview shift demanded it. So this change in worldview gave rise to new design objectives, processes, artifacts, and this corporate framework for sustainability. He didn't know how to do this. He had no map to follow. There were no um, sustainable ecological guidelines to follow. It was the click in the mind that gave rise to everything up there. And design didn't suffer, and as it turns out, neither did profits. Um, allow me a little autobiographical transgression. I suppose I'm very fascinated in worldview and epiphany because the same thing happened to me on a much tinier scale. Um, I had been the creative director at Meta Design for about a decade, and I was becoming increasingly conflicted about what I perceived as the direct and indirect connections between some of the things we were designing and those big wicked problems. Now, I must admit, this coincided very neatly with a midlife crisis. Uh, but those can be, <laughs> under the right circumstances, those can be used uh, towards positive ends. Um, but I knew, when, for somebody that had been on the planet for that long, it was going to take a lot for me to learn to design differently. Or I thought, maybe I'll do something else with the second half of my life that's more directly related to helping solve those problems. I didn't know. So right around 2001, I left my company, and I was in this space of nothingness. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and I went into my office one day, and I pulled Fritjof Capra's The Web of Life off the shelf. Some people here have heard this story. Um, 
And I read it. I read all Fritjof's books when they, come, when they come out. But on that particular day, I opened it up to the chapter on systems thinking. And I thought, ah, we at Meta Design have always called ourselves systems designers. So I'm obviously going to see parallels between the way we approach design and the way Fritjof says living systems in nature work. But kind of like Ray Anderson, on that particular day, because of the space I was in, I didn't see parallels and resonances. I only saw dissonance. And it just hit me right there. That to an extent, I was designing in opposition to the natural dynamics out there in the world, not with them. And that, to make a very long story short, was an epiphany that led me to change my life to a very big extent. I ended up writing for Chuff Capra a letter, what temerity. But he answered. He answered me. And he said, oh, I'm going to be teaching at Schumacher College. You should come study with me. And for the first time in my adult life, I had more than two weeks off in a row. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. So I went and took a three-week course with him at this place called Schumacher College, which is an international center for ecological studies in the south of England. And it was amazing. Um, everybody there cooks together, cleans toilets together, gardens together. I know some of you are out there thinking, oh, it's a hippie commune. Um, <laughs> and maybe there were some aspects of that. I'm a child of the 60s. But it wasn't too wacky, or I wouldn't have been able to deal with it. When I got there, I discovered that they had this master's degree in what they called holistic science, which Hugh Dubberly remarked to me yesterday, you really went off to study systems. And I hadn't thought about that, but he's actually right. It was the study of systems, but it was the study of systems in the natural environment. And after spending a year on that program, the way I've come to think about it is it gave me a better understanding of how the world works. And I think that's what I needed in order to begin to transform the way I design myself or the way that I teach design. So some of the things that we studied were in the areas of Gaia theory, indigenous wisdom, quantum physics. And the people in red are the, are the people that come through Schumacher College. So I had this incredible um, privilege of getting to study with some of the most forward-thinking people in the environmental movement. But moreover, what I began to realize was everyone was coming from these very different disciplines with a common objective of trying to figure out how people should be on the planet in the 21st century. And they were bringing very, very serious, rigorous thinking to the enterprise of trying to figure out how to do that. And I believe that what is actually happening in many places, like Schumacher, is that a new worldview is actually being constellated. And I think that the only way that that's going to happen is when knowledge from a lot of different areas begins to be integrated instead of siloed, as it currently is. Mary Clark says, ours is an age between worldviews, creative yet disoriented. A transitional era within, with the old, where the old cultural vision no longer holds and the new has not yet been constellated. Yet we are not without signs of what the new might look like. I think we're in highly, highly transitional times. They're contradictory. They're confusing. Nobody knows how to do what needs to be done. But I think designers are in a unique position to contribute in a very, very big way to that transition. I think what we're transitioning from is this mechanistic worldview. And I had some of the assumptions and beliefs associated with that at the beginning of the talk. And I think we're transitioning into something that might be called a holistic worldview. So if one of the, the things that the mechanistic worldview bequeathed to us is our academic siloed disciplines, and ever greater degrees of specialty within our professions. Those are great things. They're absolutely necessary. But a style of thinking can become rooted. And if I had to mimic the posture of that mechanistic worldview, it's kind of like this. Oh, typography. Ooh, yes. 
And I used to teach my students to do that. You know, my colleagues here from CCIC would all be done going, oh yes, the letter spacing is not quite right. <laughs> and if you do that long enough, you forget to raise up, or at least I did. I realized I spent like 25 years learning to letter space really, really well. <laughs> and I would forget to look up. And when you don't look up again, you don't see the pattern that connects that message comprised of that typography that's connected to what? The global economic crisis or pollution. It's like, ah, they can't be. But actually, I think they are. I, used to, I have been having my students take a spread in a newspaper and try and find the pattern that connects every single thing in the newspaper spread. And I think it actually can be done, but it takes a deep understanding of the interdependent, interconnectedness between everything we design and really everything we do. Fritjof Capra's metaphor of the web of life, I think, was a very, very apt one. So if we begin solving design problems with that in mind, I think it can't help but shift things very slightly. And much like the mission to the moon, just a small shift in the trajectory can make a huge difference in whether you hit your destination or not. Or chaos and complexity theory tells us that a small change in initial conditions can ramify exponentially through a system. So even a small change can make a huge difference. So if we want to characterize the difference between the worldview we're transitioning out of and the, and the worldview, I think, we need to transition to, it will be characterized by a shift from viewing nature as a store of resources to a web within which we're all embedded. We'll shift from a focus on objects, designing objects, to a focus on relationship. And I think that's already done. Um, I think that's already happening in design. We've been thinking about relationships for a very long time, but I think we need to expand that context to include a relationship to the next ring of people that whatever we design affects, as well as other species and the planet. So we'll shift from an importance placed on the accumulation of material goods and power to an importance placed on education, community, and quality of life. I think we don't spend nearly enough time thinking about quality of life or talking to our students about how to design a quality of life. Because how many of us in here work more than 40 hours a week? Uh huh. It's a shift from a belief in centralized, top down, control based structures to a networked, emergent structure with redundancies and distributed control. So it's no longer the imposition of structure. It's got to be balanced by emergent, spontaneous structures that arise. And that can pose dilemmas for designers. We're used to idea, realization, imposition. And I think user-centered research and the design of software is a very good model for the direction in which design is going to have to move. It's a shift from an emphasis on competition to an emphasis on cooperation. And that sounds cliche, but if you read the daily paper, it's always peppered with the language of war and the language of competition. So collaborative skills, I think, are one of the most important things that students today can begin to learn. It's a shift from knowledge based on specialization to knowledge based upon reskilling and integration. I think there's a great reskilling that is going to have to take place in our society, and that too presents a dilemma to educators like me. Every piece of new knowledge you bring into a program, you've got to take something out. But I'm betting most of the educators in the room today are engaged in this query. It's like, how do we prepare students for the 21st century and some of these very challenging problems? At the same time, we teach them to be a designer. What are the formal skills that we, we need to teach them? I care desperately about typography, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that sometimes I wonder 
if my students need to learn to letter space, with, letter space within fractions of millimeters that I did. I just don't know. And I think it's okay to say I don't know. And finally, a liberation from nature and a one-size-fits-all mentality to place-based knowledge and lifestyles. Of everything I've studied in the last 10 years, the thing that is probably most important is this idea of place, what it means to live in place and what it means to design in place. So my, my question is, is it possible to create conditions to intentionally shift our individual and collective worldviews? Well, I'm sorry to tell you I don't have an answer to that, but I can share with you some of the things I'm trying. Slow down. I think it's really difficult to incorporate new learning or to leave space for new insights when we're dancing as fast as we can. And how many of you have ever felt like that? I know I do every day. <laughs> Live in and design for space. I think these two pictures beautifully illustrate uh, the difference in this worldview metaphor I'm talking about. This is a fishing village on a coast, a coast in Mexico that's grown up organically over the course of generations. And this is a community in Sun City, Arizona. I'm not picking on Phoenicians, as you heard from Kurt. I'm a Phoenician, third generation. And my dad used to live just outside the screen there. But that was designed very quickly and imposed on the desert, irrespective of place. And I don't know if you can tell, but it's rimmed by golf courses that in the summertime must be watered at night because as every good Phoenician knows, if you water during the day in the summertime, the water evaporates as fast as you can put it out there. So that's not a place-based design. It's a focus on relationships, not things. Quality of life has to do with creating a robust web of local analog relationships and sharing resources. Ask how much is enough. That's sometimes not a very popular thing to suggest. Our modern worldview promotes consumption as a form of, of recreation. And I think every one of us has to ask how much is enough. How many of us make enough money? I actually feel like I probably make enough money. And once you kind of get to that point, you can start to have a little wiggle room to do other things. How much stuff do you need to accumulate? Think in longer horizons of time. Act and design with future generations in mind. There are ripples of consequence that radiate out from our actions and designs. Like design something for two generations out. It's kind of like the clock of the long now. Has anybody read Stuart Brand's book, The Clock of the Long Now? Really highly recommend that. They're, they're building a clock that humanity will have to keep running for like, I don't know, 10,000 years. People play, place then profit. So business and design objectives should include a concern for people and planet as well as profit. And these are three great books that talk about how that can work. Mindful relationship to other. Okay, this can seem a little sentimental, but I actually think it's very important. Reestablish a mindful relationship to the natural world. We spend far too much time in environments of our own making, and we forget that we're embedded in large natural cycles. Look at the headlines every time there's a flood. Oh, God, I'm over. OK. Learn to connect the dots. Become aware of our unchallenged beliefs and assumptions and begin to see the pattern that connects our worldview to wicked problems and how and what we design. And finally, adopt new postures. Shifting our worldview will require new postures with less certainty, more speculation, boundless curiosity, a commitment to lifelong learning, humility, and the acknowledgement that ignorance can't be solved. Rather, it is part of the human condition. Wow, two and a half minutes over. Thank you.